It is six o'clock. This is Vice Chair Diane Christ, and I'm sitting in for Chairperson Laner. And I am calling the Transportation Advisory Board for August 14th, 2023, to order. Okay. Roll call. Council Representative Yarbrough. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Vice Chair Christ. Present. Board Member Bennett. Present. Board Member Wickland. Uh, present. Board Member McInerney. Present. Board Member Mickey Burroughs. That's it. Okay. Is, do I hear a motion regarding the minutes from last meeting? The July meeting minutes. Does anybody have any corrections or discussion? Yes, um, on page four of the minutes. The Vision Zero stakeholders and partners list, it's much shorter than the list that was in the handout that was given to the board members at the meeting. Now, I can't recall if the longer list was actually presented at the meeting. And I'm going to ask a staff and board members to search their memories and help me out with that. So uh, my point is that if the longer list was presented, it should show up in the minutes. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Board Member McInerney. Uh, we'll add that to the uh, to the to the um, minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, we. I think the one we did give has more of the stakeholders and partners, kind of a longer longer dissertation. Here, so. Okay, we'll thanks. add that. Also, in the same part of the minutes, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a sentence. I guess it's a sentence. A quote, it will be embedded in the action plan, will involve changing policy, end quote. I don't quite understand that, and I wonder if there's a missing word in that sentence. Can you call it up, or uh, shall I read it again? Um, do we have that? Line 19? Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's it for me on the meeting minutes. Any other comments? Okay, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Uh, yeah, I move to approve the minutes from last. Okay, so moved and seconded. They are approved. Oh, wait, we need to vote. Can everyone vote to approve the minutes? Aye. Aye. Okay, next item is communications from staff. Uh, good evening, Vice Chair. My name is Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont. We've got a number of items. We started with three, and now we're up to about nine. So I guess there's a lot of things going on these days in the city. So uh, I just wanted to remind everybody of our seventh annual Sustainable Transportation Summit on August 30th from 8 to noon. 
A uh, number of you have signed up, which is great, so thank you very much. But if anybody else wants to sign up, please let me know and just email me uh, at my email address and we'll get you signed up if you'd like to still attend that. Um, we also have, uh, there's Dr. Cog, Denver Regional Council of Governments, puts together a civic academy every year. And if you'd like to be part of that, they're taking applications through August 25th. It's basically a seven, seven week course starting September 12th. It's in person at Dr. Cog every Tuesday from 6 to 9 p.m. So you'd have to go down to Denver to make that work, but it is a great course if you're involved or if you wanna get further involved with um, government, city government or uh, regional government and start to understand more of what's happening in the processes with funding and all those good things. So I wanted to let you know about that. And then also, kind of the bigger thing that's been kind of bantered about in the emails over the last couple of weeks has been the Vision Zero timeline. So we wanna be clear about what we're trying to do from staff point of view. We are trying to hire a Vision Zero coordinator in the next two to three months. So we should have that done in the next two to three months and get that completed. Once that person starts, uh, we will work in earnest to get to establish that task force and have that person help us. Because we really think this person has to be part of that effort. You know, we can't start it and then have somebody come on later and try to catch them up. So we want them to be part of that uh, effort as well. And then we'll start applying for the action um, plan grants that are out there. So there's a lot of planning dollars available to do those action grant or action plans. And so I uh, just want to let you know that that's kind of our step in the process, but we'll need the task force to determine how the action plan actually moves forward. So we need to make sure that's established first. So that'll all be happening in the next um, quarter, basically, is when we we'll hire and then get that person established and start that task force and get people from this uh, advisory board as well as others to be on that task force. So hopefully um, that makes some sense. I think the perception has been that um, the city is finally starting to think about zero fatality goals, but the reality is, before I started here, I mean, yeah. um, you know, more than more than you know, it's it's been engineering, engineering and transportation planning's goal to not have anybody die on our roads, obviously, since the beginning of you know cars on roads, basically for this city. So we just want to make sure that you don't think that this is like, oh, we're just starting this process and this is a new effort. This is something that the this staff has been concerned about since we've all started and so just to give you a heads up um, vision zero is just something we're going to keep we're going to make better and better and better so uh, and we'll need the citizens of, this, of, the, of Longmont to help us with that uh, the other real reality is that the city is actually creating a center of excellence around vision zero so it's a new top-down structure it basically starts at the city manager's office and we're going to that it's so critical to the city right now that this is it's, it's at, at, at that level that we're building a center of re, the, the, the team. We're building different teams to kind of put together this center of excellence and making sure that everybody knows throughout the structure of the city of what's going on with Vision Zero. So those are the things we're trying to work on now. And I can answer, we can answer more questions if you'd like to know more about that. We can certainly answer more questions about that. But I wanted to just let you know that it is a, you know, the, the city manager's office is very heavily involved in this process. And so it's not just one department or one unit of the city, it's it's citywide at this point. Any questions on that before we move on? Because I know that's a big one. And you can always ask during your items from board members too, if, the, if other things come up. Phil, you know, will a task, will the task force process involve a consultant or would the consultant only come on afterwards to prepare the plan itself? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we're not sure at this point where we're gonna involve a consultant or if we need to involve a consultant. Um, Jim has more on that. I'll echo Phil's uh, answer in that we're not sure yet, although we did budget money for a consultant for next year in the 2024 budget. So uh, kind of uh, covering our bases on that one, but we, we originally anticipated that we would use one. We changed our minds. Now we're, we're sort of still up in the air, but, but it, if, we, if we decide that, and that could be part of what the task force kind of decides early on, we'll, we'll be ready. I also think it'll, it'll depend on who we hire. If 
that person has really a high level Vision Zero coordinator and, and has a lot of that experience, we may be able to use that experience to help uh, put together the action plan in-house, as it were. Um, I was just going to ask, so you, we had the plan from last month, and so I think a few of us went through it and made some comments and suggestions, and I was just wondering when the best time is to do that um, in a public way so that maybe we can have a discussion with all the board and kind of bring together all of our ideas at one time. Uh, yeah, board member Burroughs, I think the original idea was we were going to uh, just solicit your responses back individually and put it into the action plan outline at staff level and then bring it back to you with those additions. If you'd like to do something more public than that, um, I think that's up to the board. Would you like to make a motion, uh, Council Member Burroughs, to discuss? Yes, please. I will make a motion to open a discussion about the Vision Zero plan. Do we hear a second? Well, I'll second that motion. Just for clarification, is that for a future board meeting or is that for this one? Uh, for right now. Okay. If we could discuss. Um, Council Member Burroughs, if you'd like to start the discussion. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, board member Wickland. Okay, um, if the board could vote to approve the motion on the floor to discuss Vision Zero input. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. We need two thirds, so I think we have it. Okay. We need four. Can Councilwoman uh, Yarbrough vote also? Okay. All right. So the motion does not pass, and we will table that discussion. And continue on with our um, agenda for today. I'll just keep going with communications from staff. I'm sorry, I've got a few more. <laughs> Sounds good. Go ahead. Uh, just want to let you know that the um, rapid flashing rectangular, that's the one I'm missing, rectangular rapid flashing beacons for the three blocks along Main Street for the mid-block crossings are going to be installed before the end of summer. So if you'd like any more information about that, Kyle is here to answer any of those questions. Any questions about the RRFBs, rectangular rapid flashing? Okay. Great. So look forward to those. Those are going to be exciting. Um, also, school is starting, so we're going to, we'll, you'll see uh, increased enforcement activities around those school zones in the coming weeks as school gets going. So look Look forward to that, and also we're, we've put out some education materials as well to let people know, you know, watch out for little ones walking and biking and, and taking buses and those kind of things uh, as we get into the new school year. So just want to let you know that was happening. Uh, we've got a quick slide for you about the 17th annual uh, 17th Avenue missing sidewalk section that we're working on right now, and I've got Tom Street to help us uh, talk a little bit about that. Let me get that up for you. As Phil mentioned, my name is Tom Street. I'm with the Public Works and Engineering Department. Um, our 17th Avenue sidewalk reconstruction project is currently in progress. Uh, construction started approximately three weeks ago. Uh, the limits of the project is along the north side of 17th Avenue from Cook Court going east to approximately Lincoln Street. 
This is an, uh, a replacement project. The existing sidewalk is an asphalt sidewalk that has been in place for many decades. It's deteriorated, it's distressed, it's in very bad shape, and we're in the process of replacing that with a much wider uh, concrete sidewalk. The um, design on this process took some time. There were about 18 different parcels where we needed easements and right-of-way from. So just the right-of-way acquisition process took 18, 20 months. But, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we have finished all the design right-of-way. Project went out to bid during the second quarter of this year. We opened bids. We actually got a fairly competitive bid from our low bidder. Our low bidder is a company called Stone & Concrete. Total cost of the project came in at $820,000. And uh, we expect that uh, most of the civil, most of the hard improvements will be constructed this year. We anticipate that we'll probably need to come back next spring and finish up all of the irrigation and landscaping work. Any questions for Tom? Very excited about this project finally getting underway and hopefully done. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jim for some Boston Avenue Bridge and Spring Gulch land use. So continuing with the topic of ongoing CIP projects, um, we were issuing a press release earlier today uh, on the Boston Avenue Bridge project. Um, construction, uh, that's the $12.5 million uh, bridge project project. Uh, between Price Road and um, Sunset Street on Boston, uh, just uh, west of Left Hand Brewery. Um, part of the, uh, one of the components of the RSVP project, uh, we had had uh, a bidding earlier in the year, um, selected a contractor, and that contractor is starting this week. So you'll start to see activity down there. Uh, current plan is that uh, the road is to remain open. They'll bridge, build the bridge half at a time. Um, and then uh, uh, there will be some selected closures um, during the, the course of construction, um, mostly uh, uh, simply to, to stage materials, uh, but traffic will remain open for the course of the construction. Uh, the other project we have that is will be uh, coming up soon is the Spring Gulch Number 2 Phase 3, extending from existing trail at Union Reservoir down to 119, uh, with a uh, underpass under the uh, Great Western Railroad. Um, that project was bid out. We have selected a contractor um, and that uh, they are working through the contract items, um, but we anticipate hoping to see construction started this year, uh, probably more than likely within the next two months. That is it from staff for now. All right, thank you, staff. We're moving on to number seven, action items. Oh, hang on. Council Member Burroughs. Um, just a question about the Boston Avenue work. Uh, what's the plan for the bike path in that section that goes through? Tom, do you, um, do you aware what the, are the bike path under the, mm -hmm. okay, are the bike path under, um, under the bridge is has been closed for the number of months. Uh, there is an established detour, and that detour will continue uh, to be in effect until such time as as they open it up. Um, bear in mind also that that within the next few months, the the next phase of RSVP will be um, be undertaken by the Army Corps of Engineers. They have finished their design. They are bidding the project out, and that extends up to just a little beyond sunset. There will be an, an additional closure. Uh, right now, it's kind of like open through there, although it is fenced off. Uh, that part of the trail will be closed, and there will be a, um, a revised detour. Okay. Because it's not the best detour. Understand. We've heard we heard some a lot of uh, criticism about it, um, uh, but it is the 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 best detour we that staff has has worked on, um, and it, there's not a lot of options in that area. Yeah, it, it's just a little the. The railway tracks, for example, are pretty gnarly to cross over on a bike now because it's pretty deteriorated. And then the the um, gravel path that goes to connects to Sunset 
it's not well maintained. It's really overgrown with weeds now. And in the winter, it's not maintained at all. So just because I, I know this is a long-term project, it will be maybe some more work done on those two. That'd be great. Thank you. Board Member Wickland. Uh, Jim, just to continue on the Boston communication. Uh, in the interim, uh, until probably a more you know easier practical detour can be made, uh, will bikes be welcome on the road? Or like, because I'm assuming it'll be stop go traffic a little bit, or is it going to be a very narrow two way or, or something like that? You mean on Boston? Yeah. I am not exactly sure yeah. what the existing what the plan is going to be yeah. for for Cause bike and peds on on the bridge. Yeah. Yeah, I know west of the bridge the road gets narrow, so shoulder wise doesn't quite work. But well, Phil's let me know that that bikes will not be restricted; they'll okay. still be allowed on the okay on the bridge. So, so. so in interim, you know, people have a way, and and I assume with all construction, traffic will be going pretty slow. We yeah. anticipate that it will yeah. be. Yeah. Um, we usually, in, in, in some cases, we do lower the speed limit in the construction zones. Yep. Uh, we can look into that. Cool. Thank you. Board Member McEnery. Regarding that same construction zone, will it be signed uh, to indicate that bicyclists can use a full lane in order to avoid conflicts? We can certainly look into how we, how we sign that as a share the road kind of feature, make sure that's understood that bicyclists will probably need to take a full lane for that stretch. Okay. I think we're ready to move on to action items. Um, section A, uh, appointing one tab member to the TMP consultant selection team. Oh, go ahead. Oh, did I miss that? Oh, that was after communications from staff, sorry. Um, so, do we have any public invited to be heard? We're on number five. I don't think we have any public in the audience, but we did want to point this point you to the uh, email that was sent out earlier, or was, the, this, there was an email sent out by Scott Conlon, and he is asking about um, Different things associated with a possible rec center and library, uh, with a with a tax coming up, tax request coming up, and so he did in, indicate that that was supposed to go to the TAB, and he did indicate that he could not be here because he uh, he is a member on the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, so he could not be here. So we assumed that he wanted to make that statement, so we wanted to put that in front of your uh, in front of you tonight as this email. But that's all we had from public. Okay. Has everyone had a chance to read it? Any discussion or concern? Comments? Okay. All right. Uh, well, I have a question of Phil is um, how would you like us to respond to this? It seems like um, Mr. Conlon's asking for our input. On, I'll invite uh, Chair Christ. I think um, uh, let us know if you have any input, but I think it's just him making a comment and asking staff for some information mostly. So if there's a request of TAB in there, um, I don't have it. I didn't print, I didn't print my copy out, but uh, um, if, if there is a direct request, uh, we'll, we'll certainly can ask you that through maybe email channels or something like that. But I think... At this point, I'm assuming, it, I'm taking it as just his comment, as if he was a public and divided be heard. And yeah. we don't respond back to that, as mentioned earlier. Yeah, he finishes with, if there's anything you can share on early studies or reviews, it would be really helpful if you could share it, if this could be shared. I would just say our comment back from staff, as staff, was we don't have enough information yet on what's all incorporated into this, into this proposal yet. And so we can't make evaluations on how much traffic is generated until we have better understanding of what's actually going to go into that site, where it's going to be located, and those kind of things. 
We think that there's a lot of things out there associated with the existing schools, like roundabouts and neck downs and uh, for, for ease of crossing. So there are a lot of things going on out there right now that are already in place. And we would look at uh, how this proposal, if it's passed by the voters, uh, comes forward and what it looks like in the future. So there's a lot of steps before we do further evaluation on this project. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're on number six, informational items. So um, did you have additional ones? We do not have any informational items at this time, thank you. Okay, great. So now on to number seven, action items. A, appointing one TAB member to the TMP consultant selection team. Yeah, tonight staff is requesting that you appoint uh, a member, one member from the Transportation Advisory Board. Unfortunately, we have two members mess missing tonight, but we, we're asking for your support to uh, appoint one member of the board to work on our Transportation Mobility Plan Consultant Selection Team. So that's the request before you tonight is, um, would somebody please volunteer? And then would the board, uh, uh, we're asking the board to take action and and formalize that, well, at least we would like to have one person uh, move forward as the member of that selection committee. Okay. I'll throw my hat into that ring. <clears throat> I have uh, helped to prepare dozens of proposals that involve transportation projects um, and transportation scopes of work in my uh, career with consulting firms. And I've also taken part in many interviews for transportation projects. So I think I might have something to add there. My one concern is that I would not be available on Friday, September 29th, if that was an interview day. At this point, we don't know exact, but I did put in the communication um, approximates right. as far as time goes. Yes. And uh, I move we elect uh, um, board member McInerney to the TMP. Second. Okay. The motion is to uh, elect board member McInerney to be our TAB representative to the TMP consultant selection team. Can I have a vote, please? All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Motion's carried. McInerney, you're in. All right, let's move on to action item B. Proposed 2024 Capital Improvement Program Recommended Projects. Vice Chair Christ, board members. Council Liaison Yarborough. My name is Tom Street. Tonight I'm here with Alden Jenkins, and we're here to present many of our transportation related projects in our upcoming 2024 to 2028 CIP Capital Improvement Program. Also, tonight we have several other staff members, so we should be in good position to answer any questions you may have. And I uh, wanted to mention that if you do have questions, feel free to jump into the discussion at any time. As far as the format for tonight's presentation, as I mentioned, we're going to present uh, many of our transportation projects. But uh, at the end of tonight's presentation, we're going to be asking TAB for a recommendation. And there's going to be two different options. Uh, the first option would be recommendation of the CIP as presented by staff. The second option would be uh, recommendation of the CIP as presented by staff but with revisions recommended by the TAB. I'm gonna go into just a little bit of background information on our CIP or Capital Improvement Program. Our CIP first and foremost is a planning document. It uh, identifies the five-year infrastructure needs throughout uh, the city. Uh, a project within our Capital Improvement Program can be 
can really fall into three different categories. It may be a brand new project, it may be a replacement of an existing infrastructure, or may, it may be modification to an existing facility. Our CIP identifies met and unmet needs in that uh, our projects are grouped as funded, partially funded, and unfunded in the CIP. And our CIP is a dynamic document. It changes each year in response to changing priorities and funding levels. And uh, one item to note um, is that even though our CIP is a five-year planning document, when City Council reviews all of our CIP projects this September and they uh, move forward with approvals of the budgets in October, only the expenditures for 2024 would be approved at that time. So even though it's a five-year planning document, expenditures are only approved one year at a time. Staff will use a variety of information to help determine which projects go into our CIP. At the highest level is our Envision Longmont document. It's our comprehensive and multimodal plan. And the overarching goal of this plan is to develop a complete, connected, and balanced transportation system throughout Longmont. Staff also uses a variety of other master plans and studies to determine which projects go into our CIP. Staff may be they may use our storm drainage master plan, our parks, rec, and trails master plan, Longmont, Longmont roadway plan, etc. So a, a lot of guiding documents are used by staff to determine which projects go into the CIP. Staff also uses uh, various asset management plans to guide which projects go into our rehabilitation program. We'll also use bridge inspection reports that we receive from the state every two years. These reports will help guide which bridges need repair, which bridges need to be replaced. And of course, you know, funding is always a consideration in selecting projects. In Longmont, we have two dedicated uh, funding sources to, for transportation. Uh, the most critical is our three quarter cent street fund sales and use tax. This is a tax that was initiated in 1986. It was originally set up to maintain and improve our street system within Longmont. Since that time, it had been extended six times until 2019. In 2019, this tax was permanently extended. The uh, second funding source we have in Longmont for transportation is our Transportation Community Investment Fee, or TCIF. This is a, a a fee that has restricted uses uh, per our municipal code. It can only be used on arterial street and intersection improvements. Uh, this fee is levied on new construction and these fees are collected at the time when building permits are issued. But again, when it comes to funding transportation in Longmont, our street fund sales and use tax is by far the most important, the most critical uh, revenue that we have. In our upcoming CIP from 2024 to 2028, we have uh, many different types of projects. We have bridge projects, asset management projects. We have multimodal alternative mode projects, safety projects. But uh, our focus for tonight is gonna be on projects that have a funding request for 2024. Uh, all of the projects that you see on the slide, up on this slide, are projects that will be presented tonight. The information on this slide was included in the TAB communication. Uh, it shows a couple different things. It shows the proposed funding, the funding that is being requested by staff in 2024. Funding coming from the street fund is coming in at just over 15.6 million. Funding being requested from TCIF is coming in at just 400,000. So the, the total staff request for funding from these two sources in 2024 is just over $16 million. First project we wanted to talk about is uh, TRP001 as it's identified in the city CIP. This is our asphalt pavement management program. This program on a yearly basis will have five, six, seven different projects. Uh, this is a program where we hire contractors heavy highways, civil contractors to perform all of the work. Uh, projects may range from 
pavement rehabilitation, concrete repair to pavement preservation projects such as crack sealing and chip sealing. Uh, the goals for this program, we have listed some of the high level goals for this program. We have listed in the lower right corner of the slide. And uh, one of the chief concerns of staff is, is that we are always trying to design, construct, and maintain all of our transportation improvements in a fashion that we end up with the lowest possible life cycle cost for that infrastructure. We like to make data-driven decisions. We use our pavement management software and related tools to determine which projects go into these rehabilitation projects. And uh, equally important to us is our effort to build credibility as good stewards for use of our limited public funding. Uh, asset management truly is a core responsibility for our staff. We have th over 357 centerline miles of roadways in the city and the lion's share of maintenance and rehabilitation completed throughout Longmont is completed within this program. Our next project is TRP-011, our Transportation System Management Program, or simply TSM. Again, this is another program that on a yearly basis will design and construct several projects. Projects may range from ADA improvements to neighborhood traffic mitigation, projects to safety projects to alternative modes. Again, a, a lot of different uh, projects are designed and constructed within this program on a yearly basis. Tonight, we wanted to mention four efforts that uh, we'll see a focus on in 2024. First projects I wanted to mention are two projects on County Line Road. Our first project on County Line Road will um, widen County Line Road from 17th Avenue up to Colorado 66. The widening of, of this roadway will accommodate buffered on-street bike lanes. Uh, also included in the scope of this project is pavement rehabilitation and various drainage improvements. This project is currently under design. We expect in 2024 that we'll finish the design effort. We'll acquire all needed right-of-way and easements for the project and this project is slated to start construction in 2025. I also wanted to mention that we have received outside funding. We've received just over $3 million in grant funding for this project. So um, Phil has done a great job as far as bringing in that state and federal funding for this project. Our second project on County Line Road is a segment from Zlayton Drive to the St. Vrain Creek. Uh, this uh, project is very similar to the segment to the north. Uh, we're going to widen County Line Road to accommodate on-street bike lanes, pavement rehabilitation, drainage improvements. Uh, what's different on this project is it's a joint project with Boulder County. Boulder County is the lead agency on this project. This project was originally set to uh, go to advertisement for construction services during May of this year, but the schedule has been delayed. The revised schedule shows that uh, the county will take this project to advertisement for construction services during November of this year. If we go to add in November, uh, a most likely start date for construction would be early spring of next year. Uh, again, this is a, a joint project with the county. Uh, the city's expenditures are capped at 475000 and the last cost estimate for this project was coming in at about 1.1 million. Third project we wanted to mention is our Sunset Street and State Highway 119 improvement project. This project has two distinct uh, components. The first component is a road diet on Sunset Street from Kansas Avenue north to Nelson Road. The second component of this project would be intersection improvements on Sunset Street at uh, State Highway 119. This project is in the process of designing dedicated right turn lanes, dedicated left turn lanes for both approaches on Sunset Street. The project also includes various bed and bike improvements. Uh, the good news on this project is that it had also received outside funding. We have $1.5 million coming in for the construction of this project. This project is well into its design process. We've encountered a couple design challenging design issues. 
but uh, we believe we're going to wrap up the design early in 2024, and we believe construction could start in the second quarter of next year. And uh, the last effort I wanted to mention is our Vision Zero effort. Uh, we do have funding included in our 2024 TSM program to kick off this citywide safety plan. With that, uh, I'll be turning it over to Alden. Good evening, uh, Vice Chair Chris, um, TAB members. Oh, if you could hold on just a minute. We have yep. a few questions. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Board Member Wickland. Uh, th thank you, Tom. Um, uh, back on the Sunset Street, uh, could you just define what a road diet is? Just so everyone knows and, you know, anyone watching on YouTube knows. <laughs> the, the road diet is really an extension of an effort that we started several years ago on Sunset Street. Um, it, essentially, you have a four-lane roadway, two lanes each direction, no center left turn lane. And our first effort, as I mentioned, was several years ago, and it uh, converted those four travel lanes to a one travel lane each direction segment with a center left turn lane and on-street bike lanes. That, uh, that effort on um, Sunset, uh, that initial effort was completed from Pike Road up to Kansas Avenue. And uh, our next effort will extend from Kansas Avenue to Nelson Road. And again, it'll take the four travel lanes, convert them to really three travel lanes with on-street bike lanes. Okay. And then my, I, I guess my general question is, uh, and I know, you know, hopefully with the task force, we'll be looking at street design standards as well, but is a center turn lane, you know, justified for also other uses? So, so meaning, you know, where maybe the center turn lane is 10 to 12 feet wide, where that space could be used for other uses um, or a greater buffer for a bike lane, et cetera. So I, I'm just trying to understand, you know, how, how we can, you know, look at street design standards in the future. Well, I think there's certainly opportunity, depending on the particular location in Longmont, to, to have those consideration on, on segments. But uh, looking at uh, Sunset Street itself, particularly that segment from Kansas Avenue through the intersection with State Highway 119 to Nelson Road, we do have a, a number of access needs, and uh, we really think that left turn lane will add really add a lot as far as safety to, the, to that corridor. Yeah, like I, I agree, less lanes help safety. I think uh, too many access points limits safety as well. So it's all the parking lots and et cetera. And I know that's that's way out of budget, but just as we think of the future, um, and maybe more as we, you know, prepare the city for the next thirty years. So, so yeah, just just want to keep that in in someone's head. Staff would uh, wholeheartedly agree with you yeah. as far as trying to limit access points as much as practical. The challenge becomes most of these are pre-existing yeah. and, uh, you know, trying to um, reduce, limit the number. We do make the effort on most projects, but it's a, it, it's a challenging conversation. Oh, yeah, and business owners to deal with as well. So, thank you. Um, so I um, just have a question about the, you mentioned bike lane addition to that section. Is it going to be a buffered bike lane or will it just be just a narrow lane? And do you have an idea about how wide it will be and just more details? Great question. And I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to add a lot of detail to your question. It's something that we could research and uh, determine. I, I know it's a, it, it's a, it's, it's a bike lane that'll meet our requirements. I believe we have a buffered bike lane on most of that segment, but I would have to verify. Yeah, it's not that buffered. But <laughs> Mr. Street, um, I didn't see a project sheet in our packet for the citywide safety plan. Did I miss something? And I also don't see it on the CIP summary list. Are you referring to Vision Zero? Yeah. 
Um, I heard you mention the citywide safety plan. Are, you, are that, those two that, things the same? That that reference was made to um, um, equate to our Vision Zero plan. And is there a Vision Zero project with a project number on the CID? It's, yes, it's part of TRP 011. It's included in our TSM transportation system management plan. Got it. So Thank we you. have we have allocated or proposed funding within that program for Vision Zero. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Let's continue on. All right. Well, good evening, Vice Chair Chris, Board Members, and Council Liaison Yarborough. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Alden Jenkins, Senior Civil Engineer, working with Tom Street. Uh, the next project that we would like to talk about is TRP 092, Boston Avenue Connection. Uh, this is a second phase of what was a two-part project, with the first phase of the project being completed between Main Street and Martin Street. The second phase is going to be a relatively short connection. Uh, really at the intersection of what would be a future Boston Avenue and Price Road, crossing the BNSF railroad tracks right adjacent to the project. It would provide an, uh, a new east-west connection that would be uh, uh, continuous from the west side of the city all the way to Martin Street. Uh, improvements on this project would include connectivity for pedestrians, bikes, and vehicular traffic. And then also would have a strong support component for bus rapid transit uh, since it is going to be a new connection that would be the primary uh, access route for RTD's bus rapid transit project, uh, eventually connecting to, to the future first and main station project, which we'll talk about here a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, since it is crossing the BNSF railroad tracks, uh, this project does require approval by the Public Utilities Commission, the PUC. Uh, our application has been submitted to the PC, PUC at this point, and so we are just awaiting a judgment from the PUC at this point. Our design is currently at 30% completion, and we intend to keep it at our current design level until we hear back from the PUC uh, and their judgment on whether or not they'll actually grant the application for that crossing or not. So quite a bit hinges upon that, uh, that decision from the PUC for this project. Uh, the Funding request for 2024 uh, does include lion's share for construction costs as well as a little bit of uh, design funding and right-of-way acquisition funding for 2024. Again, with the right-of-way acquisition, that would be contingent upon approval of the PUC application being granted before we would actually pursue that. This project crossing the railroad tracks uh, will be constructed as a quiet zone project. Uh, which does tie in well to our next project here, TRP-094, our railroad quiet zones. This is a project that addresses numerous locations throughout the city with existing crossings. The first uh, package included for this project is at 3rd Avenue, Longs Peak Avenue, 9th and 17th Avenues. Uh, for those that uh, may have noticed, that photo that I did provide is not a photo of a Longmont quiet zone, and that is because we don't have any quiet zones, fully compliant zo quiet zones in Longmont right now. That is actually in Boulder County. Uh, but that's the intent of this project, is to construct quiet zones at all of our crossings throughout Longmont. Uh, status for the project, this first package uh, was submitted to the PUC for approval and was granted approval. Uh, and we are looking at potentially going to bid for this project here in the relative near future of this year with construction potentially starting late this year or early next year. The second package uh, is currently under design and the funding request for 2024 is addressing largely that second package and subsequent packages beyond that. Uh, so the funding that we have in there right now for first for the first package has is, is already been secured. So this is a continuation of crossings beyond what's listed in that first package. Uh, second project, TRP-098. Yeah. Hang on just a minute. Um, board member Wickland has a question. Oh, you have, you have things to say. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, I do have oh, a question. Though. Board member Burroughs <laughs> has um, a question. Could you go back that, to that slide? Um, so the way this, obviously we don't have anything like this, as you mentioned, right now. 
would they would we expect to see this type of um, like all the barriers here along the road in the quiet zones in Lomont? Uh, it, it really is going to depend on the intersection at hand and the configuration that we have with the existing lanes. Uh, that's one method to be able to channelize traffic in one particular way. Uh, by and large, I think we're going to be using uh, raised medians for that sort of protection. Um, I don't think we have any cases where we're going to be having this sort of scenario with these raised barriers. Um, but if there is confined space at a particular intersection, it may be warranted. And as we continue to work through the design packages, second package and beyond, um, may be something that would be warranted. But right now, I don't think that's the case. So the railroad would be raised up. Am I understanding that right? So that it would slow down the car? Is that what you mean? Uh, the crossing itself would stay at grade with where it's at right now. Okay, so that for the cars approaching, they would be raised? It would be at the existing elevation of the roadway. No, it would not necessarily be raised. Okay, I guess I'm not understanding. So the Board Member Burroughs, the, the main... Um, focus on quiet zones will be the addition of gates and warning lights for the most part. The idea being that um, uh, um, by uh, the, um, the Federal Railroad Administration's rule uh, or in the early 2000s um, for trains to be required to blow their horns at every crossing, uh, they blow at about 95 decibels, which is rather loud. Um, so to, to, to institute a quiet zone, you do safety improvements. And in most car cases, it's going to be like a double set of gates. Uh, so cars cannot drive around. In some of the areas where there's pedestrian movements, there also might be gates for the pedestrians as well. The configurations of the road, for the most part, will stay the same. So if they're, in this case, this looks like, in my head, mostly like a rural crossing, um, but in most of our cases in the city, we'll be adding, as Alden indicated, some type of, of, of median or curb work in the roadway to isolate the lanes where gates might be located. Uh, each crossing is kind of different, um, so each one is, is, a, is kind of a, di is a, is a, is a different design. Um, one thing, other, other thing to add um, in that uh, the Quiet Zone Project did receive a grant from the Federal Railroad Administration um, which was about, uh, at the time, $4 million, which was about half the project. The project, we've seen some cost increases. We have chased another grant. We were not successful with it, but um, it is moving forward. Uh, th thank you, Alden. Uh, back to the Boston, is there any status or, or hopefulness from Puck to actually approve this? <laughs> Uh, because I know we talked about this last year as well, so just, sure, you know. sure. Board, mem board member Wickland, uh, the BNSF has indicated informally and now formally at this point that they do oppose the project. Okay. Um, and they have told us that they will they will do what they can to to fight against it. And so, the city has submitted a uh, pre testimony for that project, uh, as opposed to actually going in front of an administrative law judge and 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 uh, arguing your case at that point. So that should help, at least in terms of timeline, help us uh, hopefully move more quickly. Uh, but in terms of actually granting the application, um, beyond my knowledge, I'm not aware of anything that's been indicated. About four months, I guess, is our, is our timeline. But in terms okay. of uh, approval of the actual application, I don't think there's been anything that's been submitted at this point. Yeah, because that, that crossing hangs on a, on a lot of future planning. Yeah. <laughs> certainly does. Uh, and then uh, for the quiet zones, it, uh, well, one thing is uh, the crossing arms and lights. What if, uh, I'm assuming there's still like little bells uh, for visually impaired uh, members of the public. Yeah, I believe um, that uh, wayside horns or bells yeah, are used yeah. for, for that case. Yeah. And then uh, any reason for the jumping around? Um, because, you know, it's like third, Long's Peak, Ninth Ave. Uh, whatever, and then, then it goes 4th, 6th, 21st, uh, or, you know, was there a reason of not just going south to north or north to south? <laughs> Board Member Wicklin. Um, 
originally when 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 first directed by city council it was directed to start from basically in the downtown area the old old neighborhood area by third and move north um, unfortunately as we as the fra got involved um, and working with bnsf um, these um, seem to be the first sets of intersections that came out of of those negotiations with the fra agreement uh, they were pushing these for some strange reason uh, which was unknown at the time. We still don't can't figure out rhyme and reason. The next year, I think we're seeing fourth um, and then sixth and continuing in, in 2025. We will be continuing, or 2024, excuse me. Uh, I think we hit uh, uh, fourth and then sixth and then continue yeah. to move north. So, yeah. um, so it was, it was yeah. it's just an odd kind of occurrences of how FRA uh, directed yeah. us in the agreement. I, I thought it was odd too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Then I guess final question is, uh, because it was mentioned there's so many crossings in the historic east side, um, was there ever kind of conversation to maybe restrict a, a car from going over to maybe save some money for a crossing? Um, and then maybe, you know, smaller arms for just peds and bikes. So a, a modal filter per se. Actually in, we have proposed closing a closing at fifth, okay. which we had included in the PUC application for the Boston Avenue crossing. Mm -hmm. BNSF has a very strange rule that they require two cro crossings be closed if they were to grant one opening. Yeah. Um, so we threw in Fifth Avenue, right. um, but that's a complete closure. We did not look at okay. at a, a BNSF would not accept that as a to okay. to keep you know just close it for cars and keep multimodals yeah. open. Uh, we propose that it's in the downtown, the, like I said, the old neighborhood area where the blocks are, are much closer together, yeah. <clears throat> which is also adding to the, as trains blow their horn, they're blowing them in every intersection or just a straight out blast as they drive through the town. Well, I, I like that proposal too, because then it, you know, maybe neighborhood complaints of cars will lessen, who knows? <laughs> Thank you. A couple of questions <clears throat> regarding the uh, quiet zone photo. Is the purpose of those uh, black and yellow structures or a raised median that was discussed to prevent U-turns by cars that are waiting for a train? What, what's the purpose? So what happens if you see in that photo on the, on the right, there's a, a gate arm. If the gate arm is not long enough and doesn't go across both lanes of traffic, cars will tend to go in the opposing, drive around in the opposing lane and just go around the gate. So, you know, with the train coming, people will try to risk it. Uh, that's where you usually see accidents. Um, that's the purpose of that. So when we see in areas where you have more um, higher levels of traffic, you'll see more likely a median in the road, uh, six, eight foot wide, uh, and then there'll be a second gate such that it closes. So it's, it's a, basically a double gate system to, to keep cars, there's no way for them to go uh, nowhere, no place for them to go. They just got to wait for the train to, to, to cross. I see. Thank you. Also regarding quiet zones, my recollection is that a couple of years ago when now Mayor Peck was the council liaison to our board, she mentioned that there was a possibility that the um, BNSF would agree to reroute its freight traffic outside of Longmont and avoid the whole quiet zone issue. Has anything happened with that? I'll try to take that one. Um, basically what happened was the, the railroad and the state were working together. The railroads, UP and Union Pacific and BNSF were working together to figure out a route that would bypass basically the metro area. And that basically fell through in the early 2000s. So it's not, it's not, something that people are talking too much about, except I think BNSF would certainly like to have a faster way to travel through Colorado than through all these smaller towns, but there's no money out there to help provide that link anymore. And I have a few questions. Um, On my sheet, it says that um, the first packet was funded in 2021. Is it that it was funded in 21, but you're waiting for approval to actually 
do the work? So way back in, I think 2019, when council first approved this, um, or in 2020 when they approved it, we put dollars into the 2021 budget. So um, as, as, as Tom indicated, you know, they approve budgets each year that that those dollars were were used for design they were used for in this case some cases property acquisition that money gets carried over it's still in the project budget it's not you don't see it in the in the, you won't see it in the 2024 to 2028 budget but we have a, a number of dollars that are still within the, the project budget similar for a number of these projects and then each year um, after uh, usually in uh, February we have a meeting we, we look at the CIP from the previous year and if there's unspent dollars that and the project still isn't completed or is carrying on, we, we carry those dollars forward into the next budget. And there's an appropriation, it's part of the budget process each year uh, before the next budget gets, gets approved. So there are, you may see a total, it's not an eight or $10 million project that is lined up now. There is money already in the budget, in the project. But it's this first packet that you're, you're waiting to construct um, at the end of this year, beginning of next year but you have to have approval first, is that correct? PUC approval? We have the PUC approval. Currently we're working through some of the agreements with uh, BNSF. Okay. Um, there's a, a number of, of key agreements um, and we're still waiting to have some of them finalized. Okay, so that construction date is tentative, correct? Yes. Okay, so I have one more question, and that is how many accidents have you had at crossings, at railroad crossings? I can recall, at least in my tenure here, at least one fatal. Um, as to uh, other accidents with trains, I don't have a number for you. Okay. Was it a pedestrian or automobile? Do you remember? Um, the one fatal was a pedestrian. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. It was, it was on a bicycle. Mm. Okay. Any further questions for now? I think we're, right. I think we're good. Go ahead and continue. Next project is TRP 098 State Highway 66 Improvements. Uh, as the name would suggest, this is on State Highway 66 from Hover Street to US 287 or Main Street. Uh, the proposed improvements for this project include new on-street bike lanes and pedestrian facilities, specifically on the south side of the project for the pedestrian facilities in the form of a 10-foot wide sidewalk. Uh, would include safety improvements as well for all users uh, and specifically in terms of vehicles it would include acceleration lanes and deceleration lanes in some areas where uh, applicable uh, concurrent the current proposed cross section also does include the addition of one lane uh, in either direction as as well as a strong component for asset management in um, addressing the aging as uh, pavement concrete pavement infrastructure on that project the design for this project is currently sitting at a 30% level. Uh, we actually have been sitting at that level for a period of time while we've been addressing some challenging design constraints in terms of an overtopping issue of Highway 66 during a flooding event. Uh, we do believe we have a path forwards for a solution on that particular design constraint, so we're looking at progressing that design a little further. Uh, it is a state highway. It is classified as a regional arterial as well. So it, when the time comes to construction, it is a multi-jurisdictional construction commitment. Uh, so city of Longmont, uh, CDOT, and I believe a portion of Boulder County as well uh, are gonna be all helping with this project. Next project, TRP 106. Uh, concrete pavement management program, uh, formerly known actually as the Hover Street Rehabilitation Project, uh, was renamed relatively recently in our CIP. And the intent there is this project really is, is wanting to capture uh, citywide asset management of our concrete pavements. 
And so just Hoover is just a component of that. We do have several other corridors within the city that have concrete pavement. So that includes Francis Street, 17th Avenue, Boston, and 1st Avenue. And so there's two approaches this project can take, uh, one of which is programmatic needs. So for a corridor that does have ongoing maintenance or rehabilitation needs, we can plan that out in advance and address needs uh, that we see coming up. And it also can help address urgent repairs. And in this particular case here, in this example photo, uh, heaving concrete on Hover Street at the Oligarchy Ditch due to some pretty extreme thermal expansion that happened during the heat of summer last year. So as those items come up, we can also tackle those items with this project. Uh, currently looking for uh, upcoming activity in 2024 to develop our corridor priorities. So to look at all the different areas that we have concrete pavements and prioritize where our needs are and then plan uh, those improvements accordingly and then look forwards to designing those eventually as well. Any questions? Uh, yeah, it was actually about the, the last slide. The one before. The one before? Yeah. Um, so my understanding the pedestrian bike and the bike and pedestrian path is going to be a new addition to that section of lane. That's correct. So is there a, a plan for how those pedestrians and bikes will be able to cross over if to all those streets that come in and out of that section? Because right now there's no crossings or like how, how are they going to access all the different roads that go through that section? That's a, a good question. Um, don't think I have personally an answer. Tom might be able to. Are you referring to trying to cross over to the north side of State Highway 66? Yes. Uh, again, the extent of this project, it really starts um, just west of Main Street and it extends over to a point just uh, east of Hover Street. So there's currently two signalized intersections at Hover and Main Street that would provide an opportunity to cross over between that location. Um, there is a future signalized intersection planned for Francis Street. So at some point in the future, when development occurs on the north side, there would be marked crosswalks that signalized intersection that would provide access across State Highway uh, 66 at that location, if that's what uh, what you're asking. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of entrances along, like like for uh, residents as well. You're considering the south side, correct? Yes. You're thinking of the south side. So this path will be on the south side, but connecting all those resident existing residents. But there's some also on the north side too. Well, uh, yeah, there are a few. Um, there's some more planned, but there's there's one subdivision that's closer to Main Street. Yes. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, so they're going to have to go all the way to Hover, all the way to Maine to access the other side, and then there's no way to connect on the north side. There will be future connections, but as development occurs along that north side. Okay, because there are places to go on that north side. I think there's, like, that church is on that north side, and then the place that has a pumpkin farm is also that And section. that's further further west okay. uh, than Hover okay. in the county. Yeah. So there are there are a few roads on that side, but basically it would be off that off limits for those users because they would be able to cross. The Colorado Department of Transportation has a larger plan for that whole corridor and we're just doing a portion of that plan. Mm -hmm. So as things move forward, they have some planning efforts that are already done and we can share those with you from online showing that entire corridor basically from Lyons to I-25 and showing all the different bicycle facilities that are planned for that on both sides. And I guess, Phil, that was kind of my question is what, what, what happens after Hover? So like who, who, own, who owns most of this? <laughs> Colorado Department of Transportation owns all the right of way, and we're okay. working with them. They're going to provide a portion of the, the funding for this project. We also have some grant, other grant funding okay. that they were supportive of to make this project go forward. Uh, we are not going to do anything further to the west of Hover, as that's Boulder County's purview. So they're going to, 
work with CDOT on any kind of road improvements. And a lot of those improvements for bicycle and pedestrian are these uh, frontage trails, frontage roads mm -hmm. that will connect the various driveways so the driveways aren't coming directly onto, onto 66 anymore. They'll come to a frontage road that'll be shared with bicycles. Oh. And so, yeah, it's a unique idea to kind of consolidate access points and remove mm -hmm. access points. And that's kind of the big thing with the, it's called the State Highway 66 PEL, Planning and Environmental Linkages Study. And that is really trying to eliminate a lot of these access points because they recognize uh, the crash data has been extreme on this corridor. Okay. And then, uh, you know, I, you know, well, I guess Jim, Jim would be proud. Well, you know, I, I know I, I want the separated bike lane, which is what I see here. Uh, will there be kind of wayfinding options, or I know someone's working on wayfinding for bikes right now, but um, you know, a common complaint I hear is courtesy from bikers, maybe not ringing a bell, uh, type of thing, and and or maybe I, I've seen this before is lane striping um, on a sidewalk where it's like peds on one side, bikes on the other, um, as ideas, but just spitballing ideas, but. Um, I do like what I see. Thank you. Okay, let's continue. Thank you. Uh, next project, TRP 131, the first and main transit station, uh, is a bit of a unique project, actually. Uh, it's not actually going to be listed on any of the street fund or TCIF funding spreadsheets that were part of your communication, but there is a strong transportation component to it. The project is going to be located on the southwest corner of First Avenue and Main Street, uh, and it really is a, a developer-driven project in that RTD is actually the developer for this particular project, which would be an, a transit hub in the form of a park and ride, parking garage area, as well as their bus rapid transit layover location uh, when bus rapid transit comes to the city. And in order to actually construct this development, we have the extension of Kaufman Street from First Avenue to Boston Avenue, Boston Avenue that would need to occur, so that area that was now highlighted in green. So in addition to just the single lane in each direction for this project, it would have a strong pedestrian and bike facility component as well in the form of wide sidewalks on either side of the street, as well as a dedicated two-way cycle track on the west side of the street. Uh, the city is going to be taking on design and management of design and construction of this project, so we are just now actually starting beginning the design process. We're looking at a, ten at a tentative construction date of 2025, ideally to coincide uh, with a number of projects in the general vicinity, including the construction of the actual transit hub area and the next project that we'll talk about, which is the Kaufman Street Busway. Uh, to a point that I made earlier, this does not include any street or TCIF, TCIF funding. It is actually funded via the Public Improvement Fund and then reimbursements from RTD to be able to construct the actual roadway portion itself. Any questions on that? Yes, I, I have a question. Um, is, you may not be know the answer, but I'm just curious if there's gonna be additional bus routes as a result of having this transit center, because right now I can only imagine there's gonna be a couple of buses that would actually be going through this area. So is there a plan to have additional routes? I think I'll take that one. Um, so uh, board member Burroughs, the idea is that bus rapid transit's coming online about the same time as all of these projects kind of finish up. So 2026 is likely when the bus rapid transit between here and Boulder will start up. That'll be buses running every uh, 15 minutes during the peak between the station and Boulder, basically. We're also bringing all the local routes and the other regional routes to this location. So this is gonna be the transit hub for the city of Longmont in the future. So you'll have the flex bus to Fort Collins will be um, starting and stopping at this local, well, it'll be starting at this location for Longmont. And then we'll have all the local buses, the four routes, hopefully plus um, we'll get one additional route from RTD uh, to have five routes that hub at this location as well. And then we talked last time about microtransit. 
So this is going to be a great location to have micro transit going to and getting to those more regional routes. So the idea is to add a lot more service in the future. Will that include the um, LX as well, bringing that back to you? Correct. Okay. Yes. So the, the Longmont Express bus to Denver, mm -hmm. the LX series will return in the future. We have promises from RTD. We can't share those yet. We're not sure what date exactly, but they're talking about bringing that back with, uh, with the mayor. So we're excited. That would be great. Is there going to be an airport bus? There already is, but it's private. Eat black. Yep. Yep. yep, and it's very expensive. <laughs> Mr. Jenkins, if I understand this correctly, there's <clears throat> there's no city funding in any of the five years of the CIP for this project. And RTD is committed to provide up to $16.4 million. Is that correct? I don't know if I can fully answer that question as well as Phil might be able to. Well, we do have the the, the promissory note from RTD for the 16. It was 17, and now we've drawn down on that a bit with the design that you kind of saw here. Um, so there was those dollars from RTD are going to this project, but there is a lot of city involvement with this project too. And the idea is we'd really like to work with, a, again, a, re a developer, as Alden mentioned, to be the prime constructor or or piece of the de development of this property for the bus terminal and for the um, for the surrounding you're not seeing it on this picture but the surrounding development that would support be that transit supportive land uses around this station probably in the form of of high higher density residential quite frankly that makes sense at this location because it builds in automatic riders but for the Kaufman Street project, we did talk. There's a lot of uh, city money in that involved as well. We also have other funding sources for that. But um, to say there's no city money is it's going to be a little off. Board Member McInerney, the, the city was responsible for, at this phase of the project, the property acquisition. So from the, the general fund uh, through, I think, the public building fund that they – the, they've been putting in, um, I think, upwards of now $5 million, I believe, for property acquisition. It is not coming from the street fund, um, but it is coming from the city through the general fund. How much of what we see in this graphic could be built for $16.4 million? And what will happen first? The 16 point. Four million dollars must be spent on fast tracks infrastructure for transit only. So they are going to be basically buying up the uh, the construction of the parking lot that you see, the multi deck parking structure, as well as you can't see it, but there's the very bottom level is very much like the Boulder downtown Boulder Station, where the buses will be underneath there. So they're going to be responsible for all the pieces of transit that have anything to do with connecting to a future, and you don't see that on here either, but the future a future rail someday uh, along First Avenue, along the where the tracks are. So they are responsible for that, and that was the, the deal brokered uh, with RTD at the time, that we weren't getting the, the rail, so give us some portion of, of the Fast Tracks dollars to build something for transit in this location. What are the two taller parts of the structure? that are on either side of the parking deck? Those, those are really the redevelopment aspect associated with this block. So Jim mentioned that we are doing, we're already doing property acquisition. You've probably seen a lot of those come through council where we've talked about uh, purchasing property. So we have all the property, I think, either under contract or purchased at this point. And so we're working with um, a redevelopment group or we're working to find a redevelopment group that will build those sections of most of the mixed use of residential and commercial. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's continue. All right. The next project, TRP 135, the Kaufman Street Busway, is just up the street from the last project we were taking a look at. 
this is a project along Kaufman Street from 2nd Avenue to 9th Avenue. And while the name of it is the Kaufman Street Busway, uh, it really is a lot more than just a busway. Uh, it is a strongly focused multimodal improvement project that really takes uh, bike and pedestrian fac facilities to a much safer and comfortable uh, uh, use state than currently exists on Kaufman Street where currently no bike lanes exist. So with respect to that, we are looking at adding protected and detached bike lanes along the length of the corridor, which would eventually transition to that two-way cycle track uh, that would be farther to the south on that extension of Kaufman Street. Uh, the pedestrian imp improvements would include the addition of mid-block crosswalks that would tie in with the breezeways that we have up and down the corridor, uh, as well as the shortening of crossing distances on not only Kaufman Street itself, but on the cross streets as well. And the way that would be accomplished, at least uh, in large part at 4th Avenue and Longs Peak Avenue, would be via a protected intersection, uh, which is an sh example shown here. So this would be at 4th Avenue and Longs Peak Avenue, would provide a much higher visibility for pedestrians and bikes that are going to be using that intersection in all directions. Uh, would also lower the crossing distance on Kaufman Street and the uh, related cross street as well. Uh, so this is a great type of design for those that are uncomfortable or maybe not as confident while riding bikes. And that's really a, a large intent with this project is to make it much more comfortable for those that are not your strong and confident riders, but for those that want to make it to downtown uh, with their family. So beyond those multimodal improvements, this does also include a strong asset, manage com asset management component. The distressed asphalt on Kaufman Street, really from 2nd Avenue up to 9th Avenue, is in need of full reconstruction at this, this point. And so this project will also address that. Our design is currently over 90% complete. And we're looking to wrap that up within the next uh, couple of months, uh, if not sooner than that. We're looking at then releasing this for bid later this year as our ideal time frame with construction then starting in early 2024. There is a balance of uh, funding that we do anticipate needing to support this project in 2024. So there is a little bit of additional funding uh, that we're asking for in 2024. I am very excited about this project as a specialist. Great, great to um, hear. So um, I'm looking forward to it. I, I have a couple of questions. I'll start with the picture that you have right here. Um, I really like seeing this type of intersection because I think it's much more uh, friendly to multimodal. Um, I'm just wondering, like, in, in terms of the timing with the lights, like, so, so you have pedestrians and um, bikes waiting to uh, go through. Will they be given priority at this intersection or will we, they still have to wait for cars? Uh, our, uh, our current plan right now is to... Uh, have the primary street on Kaufman Street act as a um, in a recall mode so that while cars have uh, a green light north-south or buses have a green light north-south, that the pedestrians and bikes would also have that. Uh, we are going to be implementing a detection, uh, bike detection zone, uh, and then notification via um, signage and a blue light indicator as well uh, for those that are going to be using that intersection. Um, cross streets... I don't know if there's any additional items that Kyle may want to share on that, but we haven't gotten to that level of detail yet. Um, but if you want to add to that, Kyle? Yeah, so as uh, Alan alluded to, uh, we'll be having dedicated uh, detection for pedestrians and bicycles. Um, starting with pedestrians, we will have um, leading pedestrian intervals um, to safely have pedestrians get a head start on crossing before um, cross traffic uh, turns green. And we'll, we'll also be implementing a new detection system um, that can actually physically uh, identify how many and um, what location pedestrians and bicyclists are on the roadway. Um, so it's a great way to get counts, see how many people are crossing at what areas, um, but then it will give us opportunities to uh, have more flexible crossing times um, for different pedestrian abilities. Um, and then I uh, believe you have one more question I think I'm missing. Um. Well, actually, now I have two two more questions. Now. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so to make it safer for the pedestrians and the bicyclists, will 
right hand turn cars be still allowed and the flashing left hand turns be allowed because presumably you're going to have bicyclists and pedestrians mm. moving alongside the cars so having cars potentially turning into their lane when they're trying to cross over those uh, even when it's green mm. yep so those intersections will be restricting movements to allow for safer travel um, this corridor is putting extreme emphasis on uh, alternative travel so um, for this corridor the uh, spirit of it is going to be uh, other traveling first, cars second. Um, so there will be delays as this uh, corridor is not intended to be a main use for uh, vehicular traffic. Um, this corridor will be used for bus rapid transit, pedestrians, and bicyclists. Okay, that's great. Um, and my last question. I love that we have this connection, this second to mm -hmm. ninth, but then what happens when you get to second and what happens when you get to ninth? Where, where do you go? Is there a plan... Does that connect to any of the bike lanes, bike paths? Like, where, where do you go? It's great that you can go between 2nd se and ninth, but yep. you've got to get there and back. Uh, board Member Burroughs, yes, there is a plan for that. Uh, this project was originally intended, uh, and still is, to capture 1st Avenue up to 9th Avenue. Uh, this current effort is just focusing on 2nd to 9th Avenue right now until we can uh, take the extension of Cotham to the south until that starts to really gain some steam and move forwards, we're not going to construct that piece between 1st to 2nd Avenue yet, uh, since we would essentially just be dead-ending into nothing if we brought it all the way down to 1st Avenue. Uh, so when this is all done, when this project is completed, the 2nd to 9th Avenue piece will be completed first, following probably very, uh, very fluidly behind it would be the 2nd Avenue to 1st Avenue component, and then continue the extension down from First Avenue to Boston Avenue from there. We should say that the bigger picture is St. Frank Greenway up this Boston, or uh, excuse me, up this Kaufman uh, connection. So from the St. Frank Greenway up to Boston, then up Kaufman, basically the new section of Kaufman that we build. Then on the existing section that's going to be rebuilt, all the way up to Ninth. Ninth now has pretty good bike lanes to the west. We need to do something to the east that's still kind of being, that's being you know, thought and, and planned and, and it will be part of this TMP effort as well to see what we want to do to the east of that. But then also north, ideally, once you get to 9th Avenue, it's a very short stretch of Kaufman that exists, a very low volume section of Kaufman that exists with, we'll probably add Sharrows or something like that to take you up to 11th, which is a very good east-west corridor as well, and it's much lower traffic than, than 9th. Part of the Main Street corridor master plan was how do you take that further north? And we actually had really good conversations with the cemetery, believe it or not, that they like to extend um, a trail through the cemetery because they like more eyes in that area so that they want more people, they want more interaction with the public. And we'll see how that goes with people riding their bikes through. But <laughs> they do, they were interested in having the connector up and then Kaufman continues north of Mountain View as well. So really, the long-term plan that's kind of beyond a lot of this and part of the TMP process, we'll talk about extending these different corridors and how we do it. Okay, thank you. Just to add to that briefly, there will, or very well, maybe a scenario where there would be an interim condition on 1st to 2nd Avenue where the improvements aren't fully built yet, but uh, our plan is to create uh, an interim connection for those going north on First Avenue to enter the Kaufman Street busway uh, or those exiting heading to the south until that full segment can be built out. We would have some interim striping and street connections for bikes and pedestrians. Um, no, I actually enjoyed that comment about the cemetery. It brings me memories from uh, traveling the world and actually going to cemeteries for fun. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I love the Kaufman Street project, partly because, you know, in the BIC, we've had many conversations about it. So that, that's been fun. Um, and then after this, I think, as Phil, you kind of alluded to, is once the TMP gets going, then, then we'll figure out the remaining connections, et cetera. And then I, I'm just wondering, because I know that this project is very expensive, is there anything we've also learned to 
maybe speed up the next project and um, hopefully bring costs down for the next one and the next one. So, I think we've learned that inflation is very unpredictable. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we'll leave it at that then. I also am very excited to see this project take form. When I was reading about it in our packet, though, I noticed that the uh, busway sheet still includes a reference to center running bus lanes being the best design approach, which is probably not appropriate because our busway won't have them. Well, I think ideally those were the best approach, but it was not the best approach for Longmont's Kaufman Street from second to ninth. So though it may be a universal best approach, it, it doesn't operate well for what we're trying to do on Kaufman and Longmont. Yeah, you're right. That should be a, all our the alternative that, that was chosen should be will be updated. Actually, we have a whole effort that's going into uh, the outreach piece of that, and so you'll see a lot of changes on our website coming up in the next couple weeks, hopefully months. <laughs> yeah, we, we should be uh, releasing a uh, interim, at least, website update, and then a more much more interactive uh, story map experience for those that want to be able to really take a closer look and dive into what is the project really going to look like at a more granular level. Okay. Um, hang on. Council, <laughs> Council Member Burroughs. Um, sorry, just a follow-up question. So is a going to be ad additional routes or um, options to get to Maine. Um, so it's okay to go up and down Kaufman, but um, I imagine people want to access Maine. And I see that, you know, you have the sidewalks here still, but a lot of, there's a lot of shops and, um, you know, public utilities on the other side of town or the other side of Maine. So is there a way, is there thoughts about how pedestrians and bicyclists are going to access those without having to cross over lots of roadways. Does that make sense? I hope they... Right now the plan, and again, the transportation mobility plan will have a lot of say in this, and the citizens of, the, of Longmont will have a lot of say in this, and we'll take it to city council eventually as well after we go through the boards and commissions. Is right now we're looking at, uh, Fourth Avenue has really been identified as part of this, as you can kind of tell, as the major east-west bicycle connector here, as well as Longs Peak Avenue. Uh, those two have been identified as the major crossing points, and so Alden's put a lot of work into making sure those connections are, are those critical pieces that get you over to Main Street. The other piece of it is also the breezeways. So we really, with this project, are taking those breezeways that are already existing to the alleyways of, of between Kaufman and between Kimbark and Main, and we're extending those breezeways to Kaufman and so that'll be part of that mid-block crossing that Alden also re referenced. So those mid-blocks will get you to Maine as well, and those will be bicycle-friendly as well as pedestrian-friendly. Oh, great. Okay, let's continue. All right, our last project this evening that we'd like to present on is TRP 137, the Main Street Corridor Plan. Uh, the intent of this project is to plan prioritize and design transportation needs for safety, mobility, connectivity, and access along the five mile stretch of Main Street from Highway 66 to Plateau Road. One of the primary efforts that is part of this project right now uh, is the 21st Avenue underpass uh, project at, uh, at the Oligarchy Ditch as it passes underneath Main Street just south of 21st Avenue and also including the intersection of 21st Avenue itself. Uh, we do have that project uh, having received outside funding sources. I believe it's just federal funding for that um, that effort, but we are going to be looking at uh, designing that in the coming months and year 2020, 2024. And it also this project also includes an ongoing effort to develop uh, improvements to wayfinding and traffic signal modifications throughout the corridor, so from Highway 66 down to Plateau Road.
So another opportunity for more questions before we have one more slide for you this evening. Um, see, I can't find it now, but I remember like north of 17th was mentioned for mid-block crossings and um, as recommended, recommended, as I remember being part of the presentation of significant pedestrian uh, risk or or crashes um, on the, along that corridor. We are currently working with uh, RTD. Okay, it's part of that bus rapid transit project that would actually go all the way up to State Highway 66 and Main Street. There's a planned park and ride up there that they're working on building. That's all RTD project for for them. That's all their money, all their planning efforts. But as they as that bus rapid transit comes down the corridor, there's certain stop locations that would have, would need mid-block to be able to operate because we can't operate that bus rapid transit as close to the intersections as we'd like. So they are looking at mid-block crossings and we've been out with Kyle and Caroline to uh, work with RTD on where those locations could be. And so we have identified two specific ones that are north of 17th and north of 21st. And then CDOT's on board with all that? Sure. All right. They will be. <laughs> they, they, they will be. They, they, they are on board because they are part of the bus rapid transit uh, program and project. Okay. And so they, and they understand. In fact, they are spearheading a study along all of 287 that shows Longmont being by far the worst crash mm -hmm. locations for pedestrians and bicycles, which makes sense since we're the only real um, city and the density is there and there's so mm -hmm. many people trying to cross and so many apartment buildings and shops yeah. along our portion of 287. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another question is just on this sheet that was given to me is, uh, um, if I'm understanding correctly, like, so there's funding status, you know, unfunded, partially funded, funded, and then year one, um, oh wait, no, never mind. I answered my own question, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Vice Chair Chris, do you want to hear all of our comments on the capital improvement program now, or should we wait until the board member comment part of the program? Well, I, th I think it's probably a good opportunity to move to the next slide in light of that question, if that works okay. for everybody. So that brings us back to the original slide that we had posed at the beginning uh, to consider two options, one of which to recommend the funding as presented by staff in the 2024-2028 TIP, uh, or option two, to recommend city council adopt that funding with revisions recommended from the Transportation Advisory Board. Would you like to make a motion, Board Member McInerney? I still have the question, do you want to hear our comments before we vote on this? So the motion would be a discussion before voting, correct? Yes. OK. Anyone second that motion? All right. Um, let's vote. The motion on the floor is to have discussion before deciding between option one or option two. All in favor? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Let's have discussion. All right, let's start with um, board member Bennett. This is a lot to take in, so, um, but I don't have any um, issues that I see at this time. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think uh, this year I, I understand the CIP a little bit better. <laughs> um, 
yeah, just understanding what what we're actually working with and what's being done this year versus the following years, and then there's could be changes later. So it, it's making a little more sense. So so thank you for going through uh, through that slowly with us um, today. But I don't, you know, I just wish there was more money. So but but you know, I can't can't get that. So thank you. Thank you all for your presentation. Um, and just a point of clarification, this is all a very active program. In other words, we'll be reviewing this every year in terms of where we are, adjustments, adaptations. Okay. So it was a very comprehensive plan and uh, a lot to think about. But I have to agree with Board Member Wickland that uh, the main sticking point seems to be the funding. So, um, I'll move on to Board Member McInerney. Uh, I appreciate uh, having the information uh, provided on the project sheets. It's great to see significant funding allocated to Vision Zero type projects including for the transportation system management program, the missing sidewalk program, and the main street corridor plan. That's great. Now, the introduction to this evening's um, CIP presentation that was in our packets includes a statement that I'm gonna quote verbatim. Quote, attached are the individual project sheets for transportation related projects with funding from the street fund and the transportation community involvement fee fund, end quote. Now I saw that and I wondered there whether there are non-transportation related projects with street tax funding. And sure enough, the summary list of street tax funded projects includes five. Municipal buildings boiler, HVAC and flooring replacements, as well as a McIntosh, McIntosh Lake Park project and Prairie Dog barrier replacements. Now, none of these projects have a, a transportation prefix to their project number. And we weren't provided with project sheets for any of them. Last year, the board was informed that the rationale for using street tax revenues for municipal building renovation projects is that city employees with transportation roles work in those buildings, and therefore street tax revenues can be applied to renovating the building. Now, I've never prepared a CIP budget, and I'm sure it's a challenging and complicated task. I'm just an advisory board member. But my advice on this matter to staff is that the optics of using street tax revenue to renovate municipal buildings are not good. So I urge the staff going forward to respect the citizens of, of Longmont who voted to tax themselves for street improvement by including only projects with a strong connection to transportation in the allocation of street tax revenues in the CIP. Board Member McInerney. Um, so I, I'll go, I'll, I'll make the argument that the boiler and the HVAC um, items that are noted in the street fund um, actually have a transportation component because they go to serve the engineers um, who work on those projects, on transportation projects. Um, the, the allowance to, to do that is embedded in um, what the city every year updates as our financial policies. Um, and it's under the term basically operations that to actually operate um, and do designs, um, uh, our engineers are, uh, would like to be in, you know, heated buildings with air conditioning. 
um, that, that's really where it, 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 it draws from is that it, uh, it's defined in the financial policies and it's under the verbiage, verbiage of operations. Um, the other item, the um, prairie dog um, item, I think, that's under our parks project, um, that is, um, that is a, a prairie dog barrier that is gonna be adjacent to the Dickens Park to keep prairie dogs out of the public right of way. Um, the good news is, is that none of the staff here had any idea about those till we actually read the budget uh, and were able to investigate it. Um, that, that's coming out of, of higher levels than, than it, it's issued through finance, the finance department and um, the city manager's office. And I think I covered three of those. I'm not sure if I got the other two um, that you made mention of, but we can, we can provide you those sheets um, for the, the items that are listed in the, that are drawing money from the street fund. And I know that in future years, there is a, a rather large chunk that's shown in the street fund to the tune of, I think, $1.9 million, I wanna say in 2026. Um, what is not shown in the budget that was presented to you is the actual revenues that come in. That is a grant funded project for a trail, for the Adams, um, the Adams Farm trail from Union Reservoir to the east. Um, that project, uh, it's shown as street fund dollars, but there is a revenue that matches that. And the reason we undertake that is the, the other funding sources cannot bring grant dollars in those funds that are, are, gener are utilized um, because it has other funding dollars from cons conservation and open space. Um, so it is, it is, budget are, is rather complicated and we'd be happy to sit offline and talk to you about it. Um, and we can certainly go through all those items that are funded through the street fund. I appreciate your response, Mr. Angstad. I would also be interested in seeing the language of the 2019 measure that the voters approved. Does it, does it discuss what the tax revenues can be used for? I would have to revisit that to, to fully yeah. fully look at it, but I can- Could, could I you can, send us a link I can, we can, we can, yeah, certainly revisit that. Not a problem. Thank you. I will say that prior to 2019, it was very much, and, and Tom can probably confirm this, is very much related just to streets. And in 2019, Maybe it was the vote before that actually that we opened it up to be more of a transportation tax rather than a street fund sales tax, which it's we've always kind of traditionally listed it as a street fund sales tax, but it it is more of a transportation component now in the new reading of the rule. But we'll send the link to you and, and you can see exactly what's stated there. Um so I just want to thank all of you for your presentations. Um as a new board member most of these projects are really new to me, so I really appreciated all the detail that you provided so that someone like me could understand what the projects are. Um, and I'm just kind of curious about how you decide which projects to move forward in actually um, pushing for funding. Are they all the projects listed here? Are they all in various stages of trying to acquire funding? Like how, do, how is it determined that these are the ones that are going to end up being budgeted for the year? I think part of that process is a number of meetings we have um, within within our department, within the city as a whole. We have a lot of different discussions. We have a lot of different open meetings. We have various um, community outreach efforts where we have an opportunity for residents to provide their point of view, what their priorities, et cetera, might be. There's a lot of effort that goes into it. A lot of discussion behind it. It's not a simple process, and it takes many, many meetings to kind of funnel it down to get to a point that uh, where we presented it tonight. Okay, um, I'm presuming a large part of those are like uh, considerations about safety, like number of uh, crashes at certain intersections. That these are the more priority locations, um, and then I would think that that would be an important consideration. That's a strong consideration for sure. Uh, you know, again, the, the advantage of having so many different functional areas in those discussions is 
everybody has a different point of view and brings up different uh, different ideas and but uh, you know safety is always near at or near the top of those discussions okay thank you i just wanted to understand a little bit more about the process I, I did want to just uh, have a better understanding because the one exception to safety and it's more of like a nuisance is the railroad quiet zones and um, like the fact that it's like four million dollars to be able to like have a quiet zone in the historic downtown district. I like can you just explain as to like why these barriers um, like are at such a cost? It's a, maybe a, perhaps a broad question, but it just it, it is the one thing that does seem like more of a luxury item that like that is not safety oriented. So the the quiet zone project currently, I think, is sitting at around ten million dollars with a four million dollar infusion from FRA. Um, but that covers, as I recall. I want to say 16 crossings all through town, not just the ones in the downtown or the old um, historic east side area of town. Um, and that project um, was came from direction directly from council. Um, I want to say back in 2019 or 2020, um, at a public meeting, they gave us direction to move forward with it and 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 put it in the budget. Uh, I, I guess I came up with another question. Um, in the in our packet, uh, TRP 124, there's two papers of it. One is funded and one is partially funded. I'm just wondering, which is it? I'm assuming partially because it's on the other sheet, but yeah. Good question, good point. It, it does appear we have some inconsistency there. Uh, you know, we do show a, a minor shortfall for that particular project, a couple hundred thousand dollars. We'll need to take a little bit of a closer look at that and verify, but uh, you know, it does look like it probably should be a partially funded project at this point. Okay. And then, uh, and then uh, well, one final question probably for Alden. Uh, as I was thinking, the transit station, is there going to be much public input on uh, that? Because I think that's also, you know, great opportunity, you know, as as old towns before, you know, the, the station, the train station was always the hangout spot. So um, to make it more of a community center as well. Um, but will the public be involved in kind of what, what the citizens want as well? Well, from the roadway uh, improvements perspective, uh, it would follow our general approach for that. So to, yeah. to work through an initial conceptual design, uh, and then from there we would be gathering uh, public feedback for those impacted by the corridor directly or for those that would be potentially using it on a broader scale. Yeah. Uh, with respect to the actual facility itself, uh, the actual RTD transit hub and, and how that would eventually look, I'd let Bill answer that question. I think the idea is that yes, we would go out to the public with and get the best input that we possibly can for that facility. Just as what you, just as you said, it's something that the public is going to want to embrace. I think, and it's going to be a center point 
or that's going to be the hub for transit for, for the city. So I think what we're trying to do is put together some pieces of this that are going to be, um, you know, kind of the requirement piece of it as far as the parking and the transit facility. Uh, that'll be pretty well set based on what RTD needs. But the surrounding areas and how those look, we didn't really, we have some good pictures and I'll send those to you too, some renderings of uh, the park space and some plaza space that's going to be along Kaufman Street. It's mm -hmm. part of kind of the overall drainage plan mm -hmm. for facilitating drainage, but it's a beautiful parkway in the in the interim. So, mm -hmm. um, and it'll also connect up, um, I know people are going to laugh again, but it's going to connect up to the railroad, railroad uh, the r railway platform is what we're hoping to do. Whether that's RTD or whether it's Amtrak or whatever it is, it's uh, it's part of this. It's part of that um, part of that puzzle for transit. Oh, yeah. No, that, thank you, because I, I just think you know aesthetics is a big thing for people to use it and enjoy it. So. Okay. So our options are to vote for the CIP recommendation in, as written, or um, option two to offer some revisions or amendments to it. Or I would guess there's an option three in that if you'd like to think about it more or have um, more information brought back to you regarding the budgeting, well, we could vote that way too. Is there anyone who would like to make a motion? Yes, I move that the board recommend option one, that city council adopt the funding from the street fund and transportation community investment fee fund for transportation projects as presented by staff in the 2024 to 2028 proposed capital improvement program. Is there a second? Second. Okay, the motion on the floor is to adopt the CIP recommendation options as written uh, and per option one as presented to us. Um, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 The motion passes. Thank you, staff. You have your recommendations approved. All right, so now we're on to section eight which is comments from the board members let's start from the left this time with you board member burrows um so i actually want to talk about a um interaction i had with um rtd this last month um so i had to travel down to broomfield every day for uh, my daughter's music class and it was every day so I didn't want to drive every single day from Lamont to Greenfield so um, I decided to try and use um, public transport to make my way there especially since it's free this month and um, I didn't have a very good experience unfortunately um, so a half an hour uh, journey by car took me an hour and a half by public transit because of the way that um, the buses time out they're only once an hour so it didn't time out with when we had to arrive, so we had to do a, a lot of waiting around, which is always a challenge when you have kids. But um, I was prepared for the waiting around. But um, of the seven buses I took, which would be the um, LD3 um, that goes up uh, north and south, um, up to the only seven, um, seven of them were late out of the eight. And one never turned up at all it was cancelled just never arrived and when there's only one bus an hour and it doesn't turn up it's not great for um, the public to use them i did find that the um, transit to the flex ride we used the flex ride as well and the flex ride part was great i had a really good interaction with them and they always picked us up on time and got us to our destination so i really like that part but as far as the LD3, it was not great. So I just wanted to let everyone know that, um, yeah, we still have some work to do with the transportation, with uh, especially the LD3. I 
I always appreciate getting information from staff about the capital improvement program. It's fascinating to see how the money actually gets allocated uh, in the city. Once again, I wanna repeat that I'm really excited that vision zero efforts are showing up in the CIP program. And uh, to me, that means that things may actually start to happen within the next four to five years. So that's uh, very encouraging, very exciting. And uh, I appreciate the board entertaining my pet peeve about the uh, building renovations once again this year. And uh, that's it for me. I'll go last, so uh, board member Wickland. Yeah, I guess uh, thank you for the presentations for the motion that was presented earlier. You know, I, I just knew CIP takes a while and, and I think uh, the, the action plan will also take a while. So, um, but I enjoy that discussion in the future. Um, and then also uh, just to kind of talk about some things I've heard from, you know, my privy of working downtown um, and talking to a lot of employees of downtown. Um, I know people who live on the west and the east side and the east side tends to be a little annoyed of uh, the lack of crossings along Kimbark. Um, just to think about for, for the safety of workers trying to walk to work, um, especially. Um, um, don't know what can be done, but uh, um, so just wanted to say it because I promised I would. So, all right. So then, thank you so much. Um, well, this was very informative, and uh, so thank you for all the time and effort that you put into helping us understand the funding projects that are ahead of us. Um, I um, I wanted to also address uh, Burroughs uh, wanting to talk about the TA uh, the um, Vision Zero plan and. Um, I would prefer to hold off when we have staff, um, but um, yeah, so I just wanted to give reason behind uh, my rejection of uh, the talking, um, just so that, because I feel like that's gonna be a major talking point in the year ahead. Um, and I don't want us to, uh, I want us to be able to have a well-rounded discussion um, when we have the staff member to do so. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge um, a article that I saw in the Times Call about a uh, vehicle crash in um, on the 17th and Atwood Street um, that resulted in uh, property damage. Um, and uh, uh, the homeowner has talked about how she's had uh, multiple crashes in that area. And I was wondering if that was just in the radar of um, transportation staff um, and if there was any um, plans to make that intersection more safe. Board Member Bennett, whenever we staff finds out or, or gets notice of, of, of crashes, fatalities, we usually uh, dig into them, try to get the police report, investigate them. Um, and at the intersection of 17th and Atwood, it's important to note that of the three accidents that damaged that resident's fence in the last, I want to say, three years, uh, or three, or the, in the last three years, the accidents there that caused damage, all of them were hit and runs. Two of them were DUIs. Um, so, um, and the, the latest accident is still under investigation. Um, so, uh, it, nevertheless, the staff did meet with the resident. Uh, we are looking at um, some small-scale safety improvements. We're putting up some, some, uh, some uh, reflectors, uh, some additional striping to steer people away from kind of the edge of the road and keep them along the center line. Um, we're all looking at later in the year, if funding is available, uh, uh, a uh, radar uh, speed limit sign. Um, there won't be any work on 17th um, physically until probably 2026, I, 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 I recall from reading our pavement or asphalt management um, plan. Um, so what we did in talking to the resident is, is we, we are indicated we would take a look at if there's any physical improvements that need to be done, we would do them at that time, but they would need to be laid out and designed. 
Uh, so we are, uh, we will be taking a look at it. Um, in the short term, we will be doing, like I said, some some reflectors to, to warn people about that, that kind of approaching curb and some striping. Um, so that will be, be done in the next few weeks. All right, thank you, staff. This was an excellent presentation. There was a lot of written material and electronic material and um, this is my first time running the microphone, so I thank the board for their patience with me. It was uh, a challenging night to, to sit in this seat. So um, appreciate all that you bring to the table, and uh, I guess if we have comments to make about um, the Vision Zero plan, we should email them to you, and you'll come back to us with a, an aggregate of everything that's said. Okay. That's all I have to say is um, I'll move on to number nine, which is comments from city, our city council liaison, Yarborough. Thank you, Vice Chair. Chris, um, I know that chair, you have to be, you gotta have much grace for people who sits in that chair. Seriously, you do. A lot of people don't understand that. It's, it's something else, especially with the new mics and everything. So people should have much grace. Um, but thank you for running a good meeting. Um, I just want to say thank you all for the presentations and everything. And I, too, am learning. Um, I wanted to be the liaison um, on this board because when I was running for city council, it was a lot about transportation I did not know about. And so I am constantly learning as you all, you, you all probably know way more than I do, um, but it is always wonderful to see staff put so much detail and hard work into the presentations and the information that they provide. Um, and just think most of everything that was on here besides Vision Zero was before I got on council. And so, um, and it ta everything takes time. We wish it could be instantaneous, right? Not only with time comes money. And so um, I just appreciate the staff just being diligent throughout all the city councils um, that change over in May, have issues with what you've done in the past with the previous city councils. And so I just want to say to staff that um, thank you for being diligent in um, when, when you are asked to do something and whether you agree with it or not, you still do it. Because for one thing, I, would, I just want to mention is that when we sit in these seats during city council, we have to listen to, we do listen to, um, the public and when they have concerns, then we come back and we tell staff and they're like, okay, okay. And so, um, so when you ask those questions, what, how do you prioritize these things? It's those people who in their neighborhoods come in and complain to us about the safety issues about transportation, um, or public safety that come in and tell us. So, um, so I just want to say thank you to you all for bringing up all those questions and comments. Um, the public need to hear those things. And again, I can't say thank you enough to staff. And um, yeah, good meeting. Thank you. OK. Our next meeting is September 11th, 2023. Do we have any items for upcoming for the upcoming agenda? On the work plan, we have the peak service study, which is the RTD rail study. Um, so we could have them come in if you didn't get enough information in May, and a lot of you, some of you weren't part of that discussion in May. I think they touched on it briefly. So I'll, rev I'll review that and see if there's any information we need more from them, or if, and we'll check with the chair on that as well. Uh, we typically talk about flex ridership, so the ridership from between here and North, uh, we've, we've between the north, which is Fort Collins and Loveland and Burford. So we can bring those numbers to you as well. Uh, I'm not sure, we do, typically don't have them do a presentation, but we'll look into whether we can get uh, somebody from transport down here to do that. And then I know this is gonna make, make some people worried over here to my right, but we have the crash report typically in September or October. So um, I think we're on, on it this year because we do have the, the integrated system that we didn't have last year, there was kind of a combination of 
two different systems, so we were a little late with the crash report, but that is something we typically slate for September or October. So those are the items. Okay, great. I'll make a, a motion to adjourn this meeting. Can I have a second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we're adjourned.